Hello and welcome to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. That is also a reminder. If you guys heard that clip, you are the first ones to hear it. That is a clip custom made for our radio show. More in a couple weeks about that clip, and we'll be talking about it here in a couple in on and off until that too. But um, super excited about that. Uh, you know, we're trying to progress this show every week, and and uh, the custom clip is is awesome. I, I love having my own my own clip. So. You are listening to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. On the phone today, clear over in New York City, we have Noel McKenzie. Noel, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Great. So, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You are just tell, just tell us your story. Tell us your your history and your and your story about how you got into personal training. Okay, so me and my husband own a in-home personal training business here in New York City. So we service people out of their apartment, home gyms, in and around Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn area for about 10 years now. Now, obviously, things have shifted recently with the whole coronavirus outbreak. So we've been doing all of our training sessions virtually, which has been awesome, a really great avenue that we've been able to explore. That is awesome. Um, but I got into fitness, you know, I think my first interest was sparked when I started running track and field in college. I had an amazing coach who literally changed my career. I was a walk-on in track and field with virtually no strong, you know, backing as far as, you know, my history with running. I was just an average mediocre runner. And he basically took me from a walk-on to a Division One collegiate record holder um, in a matter of two years. And I shaved, I want to say, at least 10 seconds off my best time. And I attribute most of that to having the right training program behind me, the right coach, the right foundation. And so seeing how I was able to completely, you know, change my pace, just my performance, everything with the right training, I, I realized that I might have an act for being able to help other people make a change in their lives. You know, if this change was possible for someone like myself, who already, you know, ate healthy and trained regularly, but just didn't know how to train to my best capacity, imagine what people can do for themselves who aren't even doing A and B, eating healthy, and exercising at all. So that's kind of where my first interest started. I worked for a gym when I moved to New York City back in like 2008 for, for about two years. Kind of got my feet wet, learned the protocol on, you know, building a program, you know, really building those relationships with our clients. And then I ventured out on my own with my husband and we started our own business. And it's been thriving ever since. That is super, super exciting. I'm super happy for you. So what, what event were you were you running in? Um, tell us about what event was it you yeah, were competing in. Yeah, mm -hmm. So the event that I captured the record in was the 1,000 meters, which is an event that's only ran indoors, which is even harder because when you're on an indoor track, you have a lot more turns. So turns typically slow you down, you know, whereas on an outdoor track, you only have those four main turns. So, you know, just to be able to do that also on an indoor track, which is, you know, generally harder to run on, was an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And um, might I add that, so I actually broke my record again my junior year of college after coming back from an injury my sophomore year. Um, or I'm sorry, my senior year. I got injured my junior year. But in my sophomore year, which is when I first captured the record, one of my fastest times, I actually ran in a pair of sneakers that were half size too small. <laughs> so it just tells you how much of it is also mental, right. you know, like how much if you can really will yourself to do things that you don't think are possible, you know, really the sky is the limit. So that was really also a little fun little tidbit to share. That That is super exciting. So tell us a little bit about what's going on with the coronavirus and yeah. your virtual training. Well, tell us a little bit so, about how your training normally happens and what have you have done to change that. Right. So typically, you know, we are an in-home concierge service. So our whole business model is on making exercise convenient. 
You don't have to travel to a gym. You don't have to leave your apartment. We come to you. So it saves you time and the headache and also the added fee of having a gym membership and all that. But obviously now with New York City being one of the, you know, hubs for this coronavirus outbreak, we're really dealing with it, you know, head on right now. Um, we've had to make a lot of changes because it's not safe anymore for us to interact with our clients one-on-one. -on -one. Even though we're healthy, you know, and not showing any symptoms, as we know now, you can be asymptomatic and still pass it on. So we don't want to take any risks there. So what we did is we started utilizing Zoom, as we're using right here, um, for our virtual training, which has been amazing. Um, you know, thankfully, all of our clients have been on board, especially, you know, being homebound. You know, you're already less active as it is. You're not getting all your steps in that you normally would. You're not taking the stairs. You know what I mean? So it's really been a great outlet for our clients to also just kind of remain sane and, and have, you know, some kind of routine, healthy routine in their day. That's good. To, that's good to know. And it's just a reminder that, you know, out of difficult times become um, opportunity. So, and right. Know, yeah, right. and it's also a reminder too that there is no excuse not to work out. We know gyms are exactly. closed. Exactly. There's always a way. Yeah, there you know, is and, always and, a way. Right, and we've been able to make use of you know just using your own body weight, which is important anyway. You know, to know how to really manage your weight in space that's a, its own form of resistance so Absolutely. you know we're telling our clients don't worry about the equipment don't worry about the weight you know we can make sure with whatever little bit that you have even if it just means you know using yourself for resistance yeah so I so tell us a little bit you recently you recently had a baby congratulations baby Maddie. thank you yes and you tell us a little bit about working out before when you were pregnant um, and during and after okay so you know I've always been one to practice what I preach with my clients I would never give my clients something that I'm not willing to do or you know I wouldn't li I wouldn't preach a lifestyle that I don't also embody so I've always been very active very fit you know exercising regularly on my own the call. and one of the challenges I face with my pregnancy which I'm sure we're going to get into a bit later, is I've had fibroids that flared up during my pregnancy and caused me a lot of discomfort. And so I was really limited, especially like in the later half of my pregnancy, because I got so large. Um, I looked like I was carrying twins at one point. Um, you know, I was limited to just basic walking and maybe some like stationary like sit and stand, and very, very minimal activities, which was frustrating because, you know, coming from someone who's been so active my whole life, you know, here I am thinking I'm going to have this, like, amazing, like, fit, you know, pregnancy where I'm going to, you know, keep up with my normal regimen, and I really had to dial it back a lot. Um, but when I, you know, after I had him, which is now almost four months, um, and I got cleared from the doctor, I started working out, you know, slowly and building up my strength again. One of the things that I have told my clients, you know, because I'm a case in point now, I'm trying this out for myself, you know, and I can, I can show you, I can prove to you now that muscle memory is a real thing. You know, because I wasn't able to really exercise for most of my pregnancy, and I was also pretty much, I want to say, almost bedridden for about six weeks post-pregnancy because I also had a C-section, so I was in a lot of pain in my recovery period. I lost a ton of muscle. I mean, I just was amazed at how quickly, you know, your muscle will atrophy if you don't use it. Um, and so my mission has been like, I want to get back. I want to get my strength back. And I have been able to, you know, gradually increase my resistance, the amount of weight that I'm using, just in a matter of weeks, because my body is already accustomed to that a level of activity and the resistance from before I was pregnant. So, you know, it's like working out now is not just about what you're experiencing, you know, in this moment and the benefits, but if God forbid something happens, which, you know, people have injuries, people, you know, have setbacks, when you do go to recover, you're going to be that much further ahead than, any, than the person who's never worked out before, just because your body, again, will have that muscle memory to rely on. It is amazing, and you may know athletes um, that have the same response. It what, what doesn't matter the, the sport. You, you see, um, you know, weightlifters that take a year or two or three or four years off and they get back into the gym, and in eight weeks they're 
you know, right. they're in shape again. And you, right. hear, this, you hear the same thing. I'm, I'm a mountain bike racer, and I've only done it for like or five. Or look at Tiger Woods, right? How many back surgeries exactly. has he had? Exactly, right, right. You know, and everyone's like, he's out. Yeah. You know, he should yeah. retire, but, you know, he's coming, but he's made a comeback. Right, right. So, so yeah, I think there's, there's something to be said about about muscle muscle memory for sure. So, um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about what kind of workouts did you do, did, how you changed your workouts during during pregnancy? Right. So, um, you know, in the beginning, before I really started to show, um, I really did try to keep up with the amount of resistance that I was accustomed to. So I didn't really change too much of what I was doing, except for the fact that I was just changing, you know, slowing down my pace. Because um, obviously I would get more winded quicker and I just didn't have as much energy. Um, but then as I got further along and I started to show a lot more, you know, then I had to be mindful of things like diastasis recti, which happens, you know, it's pretty common during pregnancy, which is when the abdominal wall separates um, just from the added pressure from the belly. Um, so I had to avoid certain positions, you know, where, you know, you're, you're leaning forward, where gravity is putting extra strain on the mid part of your stomach, um, avoiding lying on my back because you don't want to, you know, um, interfere with the heart rate. Um, but I, I did try to, you know, still train total body. Um, I understand the importance of, you know, keeping a strong lower half as well as, you know, your upper body because you're going to be lifting that baby a lot. Strong core is really important. So I did try to keep a well-rounded routine. Now, when I physically couldn't do much anymore because of how large I got and just, again, the discomfort for my fibroids, which is kind of, you know, not a lot of women are familiar with that kind of discomfort I'm referring to. It's uh, quite taxing. I then resorted to just, you know, making sure I at least was walking every day at a very minimum. Um, I made sure that any time I was, like, at home that I took opportunities to, you know, stand up a lot and stretch and just get myself moving because the, the worst thing you can do is just become idle um, just for um, many reasons. You want to make sure that, you know, you keep your, um, your body physically active also for the baby um, because, you know, when you are more active, you're actually more likely to have a, a leaner, healthier baby than if you are someone who, you know, completely just doesn't work out at all. For sure, for sure. Okay, so um, now it looks like it's about time to go to a commercial break. So we're going to go ahead and break now, and when we get back in, we will talk some more specifics uh, uh, about Noel. You are listening to AM 1470 KBSN at Moses Lake. Uh, 1470. We will be back shortly. Well, after doing my ultrasounds, I immediately confirmed that I had, had fibroids, and my largest one, like I mentioned, was about the size of a grapefruit. And so, you know, I've always been someone who's more of a holistic type. You know, I try not to rely too much on medication if I can avoid it, and I, I, I try to really heal my body from the inside out. And so, um, my OB recommended that I had the fibroid removed. Um, because she was convinced it would only continue to grow. And I had mentioned that I was looking to, you know, have a baby, you know, in the near future. I wanted to start trying. And so she said that she would recommend getting it taken out before I started trying. Well, in my gut, I felt like, you know, maybe that wasn't the best option for me personally. And so I got a second opinion. Um, I actually went to meet with another ultrasound tech, and I asked her, which, she didn't have to answer me, but she was so kind, and she told me, you know, I've seen a lot of cases with women with fibroids, they're very prevalent, about 80% of women have them and don't even realize that, that they have them, because they usually don't cause many issues. Um, the only time you really know that you have them is if they become very large, which in my case, I kind of feel, um, you know, my stomach is a little uh, protruded out, so they kind of feel it, um, or sometimes they do cause, you know, heavy menstruation and pain during the cycle. She recommended that based on the location of my fibroids that I don't have it removed, but it wasn't necessary. So I thought I would go ahead and try to get pregnant naturally, give it about three months and see if I have any, any success. And if I don't, I'll go and revisit the possibility of, you know, looking for removal. Well, I got pregnant right away, thank God. Mm, um, really? And mm. thank you. And I went on to have a very healthy pregnancy, but I did experience what's called uh, fibroid degeneration pain which is when the fibroid outgrows its blood supply, which is pretty common as well during pregnancy because what happens is your body releases a lot more estrogen 
um, you know, with all the added hormones to take care of the baby, you know, naturally the fibroids feed off of the estrogen. So the added estrogen promotes growth, typically. And so mine had grown double in size, which sounds crazy if you think about it. Um, and it explains why I got so large. I literally looked like I had twins in me. I used to joke and say that I had a baby and a fibroid baby. Um, but thankfully, during all the episodes with the degeneration pain, I didn't have any issues with my pregnancy. The baby was always healthy, fine. He never really even responded to the pain that I felt, which was really, you know, I was very grateful for it. So, since having him, my doctor did recommend that I, again, remove the fibroid because she was convinced that it would not shrink and that it may even grow further. Um, but what I decided to do is to breastfeed for as long as I can because breastfeeding actually suppresses your estrogen production and see if I can shrink this thing naturally. And if I can, at least get it back to my pre-pregnancy size then I'll be happy with that, and then I'll look at other measures to continue on my holistic journey. And what I've done also in conjunction is I've virtually cut out all processed food. I've avoided soy, because soy contributes, it has um, certain aspects of soy trigger your body to release more estrogen, so I've avoided all soy in my products. I try to eat completely organic meat and fish, so I only source my, my meat and fish from, you know, like places like Butcher box, sorry to name drop, but I just love them. They're great. Um, places that are just completely organic, grass finished, not just grass fed, there's a difference there. Um, and drinking a lot of water, a lot of leafy greens, and trying to manage my stress levels. And so far, I've been really happy with my results. My stomach has shrunk down significantly in the last four months, and I am convinced that it will only continue to do so. So, Janet had a story. Um, about with uterine fibroids. So, Janet, will you go ahead and share your story with uterine fibroids and maybe talk about how that links to some things that Noel, Noelle's talking about? Certainly. Welcome, Noel. It was lovely hearing your story. Um, I agree with a lot of her story. Um, the first child we had, um, when we did an ultrasound, um, we found that I was also... Um, carrying a fibroid and so it was something that needed to be monitored throughout the whole pregnancy and it did grow and it was at some times uncomfortable at others not that much um but I think the key that we are um coming together on is that usually fibroids in women is linked to estrogens. So during pregnancy, estrogens um, do increase quite tremendously. Part of the, the whole pregnancy, we need those hormones on board, but in itself, that kind of feeds the monster, the fibroid. So um, once we um, were able to deliver our first child, um, we made it through without problems with the fibroids, but just like Noelle, it was really important for us to make sure to breastfeed because the hormone that um, is important for breastfeeding is progesterone. And progesterone plays a huge um, role in balancing how much estrogen our body's producing and how estrogen causes um, proliferation of the vaginal tissue as well as fibroids. So um, I was able to breastfeed and then um, we chose at the time uh, progesterone was available over the counter in a cream so we chose to use that as well um, which made a huge difference because two years later when we had our second child I had no um, signs of fibroids no difficulty during that pregnancy to have fibroids um, so I feel like we have similar stories in the fact that you know um, pregnancy made those um, tissues grow a lot faster, um, but natural approaches are, are really important, I think, from a patient solution side, because we always think that we have to jump into the arena of, oh my gosh, we have to have this removed, it has to be surgically removed, and um, it's not always the case, and so 
I feel like we, before we jump into that second stage of, you know, we're going to remove it, have a surgery or have something removed, um, a second opinion is really important. And I, I love that part of Noelle's story that, you know, she went in and asked questions because if we don't ask questions, we don't know we have options. And options are truly, I think, important to um, outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, Noelle, tell us a little bit about um, how your tumor, how your fibroids have shrank because of the things that you've changed. Right. So I've been measuring my stomach. Um, you know, but when you first deliver, obviously everyone, you know, their stomach is your uterus still has to shrink and come down to its you know pre-pregnancy size. But it takes some time. That usually takes about six weeks for the uterus to return back to its normal size. So I waited until I hit that point before I started to really kind of measure my stomach and see, you know, if I could take pictures to monitor my progress. And I, since then, I now, I said almost four months postpartum, have seen a significant reduction in the size of my stomach, which tells me that my fibroid is indeed shrinking. And I can also tell where my fibroid is because it's a, it's a hard tissue. So fibroid is basically what it's made up of is muscle tissue. Um, it's basically like the same tissue that's in your uterus that just continues to grow. Um, and so it's, it's a dense uh, feeling. You know, my stomach's not squishy there. So I can tell exactly where my fibroid is and I can tell that the, the circumference that it takes up is, is shrinking, which has been really promising. Um, and so, you know, I, I agree. I think that the breastfeeding is a huge factor in that. Um, and then I just realized just from looking at my labels just how much, how many different foods have soy. Almost every single thing on your shelf has soy. Even like things that you wouldn't think of like chocolate chips, you know, and your baking, it has soy. Um, you know, and if it doesn't actually have soy, usually it'll say that it was made in the factory where soy is made. So therefore, you're more, you know, it may also have soy just from that, from being in that factory. So I've just been hyper aware of, you know, sourcing my food from places that I know aren't going to contain that soy. And um, just coming back on my knee and just like I said, I am um, and trying to eat really clean, organic only and um, really increasing my water intake because people don't realize that water is what your liver needs to cleanse all the toxins out of your body and so if you're dehydrated you're working against your body's natural way of cleansing itself so you know I'm just I'm very happy so far and I'm convinced that this is the route for me despite my doctor's wishes because like I said she did want to schedule me for surgery um, after I went to see her for my six-week postpartum checkup, and I told her that I opted not to do that. Now, the other factor that is important to mention is birth control. I do think that the birth control I was on for 10 years contributed to the growth of my fibroid. Um, it was a progesterone-only pill, and I've actually done some research from really reliable scientific journals which have shown a link to fibroid growth and progesterone. Doctors don't really know a lot about fibroids and what causes them. Some will say that birth control actually helps to avoid the growth of fibroids or to shrink them. But if you do your research, um, you'll find that there's a lot of evidence that proves otherwise. So I've chosen not to go back on birth control, and I think I'm going to probably stick to that route. Forever. Yeah. yeah, that's. Um, I'm glad you do your own research, and we deal with this in our pharmacy at Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy all the time. We we are recognized experts in hormone replacement, and Janet and I um, you know, help patients and providers all over the Pacific Northwest. So, and one thing that they commonly that most doctors commonly get um, mixed up, and they make a mistake of it, and even some books have errors in it, is that progestins, synthetic progestins, like it's what's in birth control, does not equal progesterone. They are completely different molecules. They act completely different in the body. And, you know, if we treat them the same, then they're, you know, you're going to have consequences. So, and with uterine fibroids, it's usually too much estrogen and not enough progesterone. It's not that you lack progestin, because that's a synthetic thing anyway. You lack progesterone. So, 
get rid of exogenous estrogens, um, whether it be from, you know, whether you're taking them or whether it be from exogenous sources like, you know, xenoestrogens, like you're talking about like with soy or like with plastics um, and, and or maybe a progesterone supplementation. You got anything on that, Janet? No, I totally agree what Sean's saying and also with Noelle that um, I think one of the keys is that we find a lot of sources outside of just our, our medical side with the pill. Um, soy for sure is going to interact and, and I totally agree with what she's saying there. And so it brings us back to saying that, you know, the closer to it being grown, the fresher it is. Um, the safer it is for us. So if it's not being processed, I think you eliminate a lot of a lot of issues along the way as far as nutrition and health. And so I love the fact that um, Noelle's talking about um, treating that side that she can control with making better choices for her health and her um, future. Absolutely. So Noelle. Um, tell us a little bit about how having a little one around has changed your workout schedule. Yeah, so, you know, before I had Maddox, I was very much a gym rat. I love being in the gym because I like having the use of all the equipment, and I love being able to constantly change up my routine. Um, it also just is motivating to be around the people exercising and just having that space, you know, that's separate from my home. But... You know, I've gotten very accustomed now to working out from home prior to this whole corona outbreak because of having Maddox, and I don't want to be away from him and be at the gym. Um, I'm sure I could arrange that if I wanted, but, you know, my husband and I have decided that, you know, at least while he's so young and he's eating so often, it makes more sense for us to try to find building the routine at home. So I've actually, you know, really been proud of what we've been able to do. Um, you know, I've gotten myself some, some different weights, and we have resistance bands and I use, um, you know, sliders and just like chairs and so forth around the house that I can step up on and so forth. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been great to be able to um, progressively increase the intensity of my workout and graduate to like the next level of weight. Um, and also just to get creative and find interesting new ways that I can build resistance into my workout just using whatever I have here. Oh, and, you know, Maddox is a great little cheerleader. He loves doing his little bouncy feet and watching us work out. It's like, it brings him so much joy to see mom and dad moving. He thinks it's a game. And he just grins ear to ear. And that's just so motivating, too, just seeing him, like, kind of, like, cheering us on. Well, and I, I think what some people don't realize is that it doesn't take a lot of equipment to work out at home. I mean, it really doesn't. And, you know, resistance bands are great. You can travel with resistance bands. They're easy to store. Um, you know, but there's so yeah, many I, different tools. Mm -hmm. You know, um, body weight exercises, for instance, are great. Exactly. You know, and you don't even always need a little extra weight. And if you have a baby around, you can do all right. squats with a baby, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I think, I think what's, you know, encouraging and inspiring about that is that the quicker we can get our kids involved in exercise, you know, just seeing right. mom and dad do it, the more motivated it is to them and just the more they're going to be, have a propensity to do it also. Um, right. And, you know, just back on the topic of muscle memory, I think that's just a reason to say that there is never a time that's too early to start working out. And there's never a time that's too late either for that matter, but it's never too early. Um, mm -hmm. And mention that, and maybe you know, I, I wasn't ready to prepared to to talk about this. But speaking of that, you know, thirty five years ago when I first started lifting weights, there was some talk about not letting you know anybody under fourteen lift weights. Um, about your experience, what do you believe in that kind of stuff? Yeah, so I mean. I, I think movement is really key from an early age. You know, when I, my first form of movement was dance. That was my outlet. I started when I was five years old. And, you know, that actually helped me in many aspects because not only was it healthy to, you know, get yourself, you know, working your muscles because if you, get, you don't use them, you lose them, as we know. So, you know, we're not, even when we're young and we're, 
limber, you know, if we don't use what we're given, you know, we're, we're not going to, we're not, there's no, there's nothing that's going to guarantee that we're going to keep that same physique for very long. So, but one of the other factors that really was crucial for me was it helped bring me out of my shell. I was very shy and dance, just being around other people, moving together, the interaction, learning a routine, building in that, you know, um, the mental aspect of it, you know, watching and repeating and learning and and the technique and the coordination, all of that is so important for kids too because these are skills that they haven't developed yet. So I think it goes a long way further than just, you know, the physical uh, result that you get from it. Um, so I think, I think it's never too young to answer your question, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that about wraps up our second segment. You're on with Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where we talk about everything healthcare. We are at AM 1470 KBSN in Moses Lake, also streaming live on my personal Facebook page and the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy YouTube. Um, we will see you in a few minutes. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. If you miss us in the first two segments, we were we are on the phone lines with Noel McKenzie out of New York City. She is a personal trainer, and she has been telling us what she's been doing during these times of um, the coronavirus and how she's doing virtual workouts. So I would love for you to talk more about. Tell me about a typical virtual workout, Noel. So we have tried different platforms and found that Zoom is actually the best because typically you are able to get the whole entire room in the frame. So that way if the client, you know, if you're sitting or you're standing, you're still in the frame, which works really great. We don't have to keep moving the camera, which takes time away from your workout. Um, and yeah, we just, you know, we dial in just like we are here and, um, you know, I basically would demonstrate the exercise for you just like I do in a one-on-one face-to-face um, session and um, then I watch you and correct your form and, you know, it kind of feels very similar to, you know, as if we're working in the same space. Um, I really prefer this over just doing a written online program because you lose then the face-to-face interaction, which I think is really important for accountability purposes, but it's also motivational, and it helps you feel, like, connected. I think now we feel more isolated than ever, so this, you know, especially some of my clients who live alone, and now they can't leave their house, you know, I worry about them, and so this gives them something to look forward to, to help break up their, the monotony of their day, and still have that face-to-face interaction. So tell me, you know, another thing I guess it's really nice, and I think you were, you were alluding to this, is that, you know, um, a lot of times with um, workouts where you're given, you know, given a list of workouts or whatever, and you're even maybe, you know, your coach will say or personal trainer will send you a video of, you know, from YouTube about this is the workout you want to do. The problem with that is I always worry about it because I have I have that through my coach, and who does a wonderful job by the way. But I'm always worried about my form. I don't have anybody watching my form. So on Zoom, you can sit there and you can critique somebody's form. Is that correct? Correct, exactly. Um, and so yeah, they, they don't feel like they're losing you know that that really important aspect of having a personal trainer, which is to have somebody there with you make sure you're doing the exercise correctly. So, yeah, it's been really, really effective. And for us, it's been a blessing because this was something that we didn't know if it was possible, you know, how people would respond to it um, until we tried it. And we almost weren't willing to try it until we were forced to try it. So, in a way, this coronavirus has been a blessing. It's created this opportunity for us. We're able to be home now more with our son, which is great. And, you know, everyone can still be safe. And now we have open the doors to this whole other platform of training and so even when this all passes we can explore perhaps even doing group sessions this way because Zoom is great it allows you to bring on more than one person on a call and still see everyone on the same screen you can do like a gallery view I think it's called and so you know we're, we're looking at ways that we can continue to explore this as an avenue that is really cool I'm super excited for you and I'll, I'll have to keep following following you to see how how that grows um yeah that also means that you know you could 
work out with anybody in the world. I mean, that's just cool technology. Yeah. You know, that's, I, that's right. awesome. Yeah. And we're able to serve more people right now, you know, because it takes away all that travel time. Right. You know, we live in New York City, so thankfully we also sit in traffic. We have the train, but the train isn't always reliable. And we easily lose two hours of potential training time with each client. So now, think about how many more people we could see in a day. It could be, it makes it so that we can reach a lot more people. Right, right. So tell me a little bit about what a typical workout looks like. What's the length of it? What kind of, I, I know it's very personal, um, mm-hmm. but what would you say is a, a, an average type workout and how long are they and how many days a week? So our sessions are always an hour long. We do typically about 55 minutes of exercise, and then we'll do a stretch at the end, a full body stretch. Um, and then in the beginning, we'll do a little warm up just to keep you kind of loose. Um, in terms of the format of our program, it really depends on a few things. First off, the style of, of exercise, what your goals are. So whether it's prenatal, postpartum, strength training, weight loss, uh, maybe, maybe you're recovering from an injury, and so you're trying to work back and build up that resistance again. Um, that's, that's one factor. The other factor is how often you train. Typically, we recommend that you train a minimum of two times per week just to build up that consistency to really build that muscle memory. Um, but we do have clients that train anywhere from one to three times per week. So then we'll, you know, that really determines how we break up the actual workout, whether we train total body, mm-hmm. um, whether we do like a push-pull, whether we do upper body versus lower body. Um, that also depends on what your goals are um, and like how intense you want the workout to be. Um, but I would say most often we do total body workouts that you're hitting everything in the same session. You walk out away from the workout feeling like an overall fatigue you know, and that there was nothing that was, you know, left, left untouched. Um, yeah, and, and we usually do a circuit training format. So we'll pick, like, three or four exercises that target each part of the body. Then we'll repeat that circuit once or twice more. And then we'll move on to a completely new circuit and repeat that circuit again two or three times. That way you are incorporating quite a few different movements in the workout but also you are not bored. So we're not doing just the same four exercises the whole entire session. Yeah. And it also changes session to session, you know. So every week or every workout is going to be different. And there's always some kind of resistance and some kind of cardio built into these workouts? Yeah. So, you know, we usually kind of shy away from promoting uh, or pushing our clients to do running on the treadmill or you know, people are always asking us, should I also be doing some cardio? Well, what you don't realize is when you do resistance training, you're also getting your heart rate elevated. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, because it takes effort to move weight, and it also takes effort to move your body weight in space. Um, so that in, it, in itself is, is building up that stamina. But also with resistance training, you tend to burn more calories even after your workout. So it tends to be a more effective outlet for exercise. You know, it's a win-win. You save a lot more time rather than jumping on a cardio machine for an hour where you're only working on your your stamina. Your arms aren't doing anything, really, and your legs are just doing the same repetitive movement. Now you're working on building strength. You're working on, um, you know, getting your muscles stronger and also getting your heart rate up in the same breath. Yeah, and I... You know, I always tell, um, we always tell our patients, or I, I should, I'm not going to speak for Janet, but I like to tell my patients or anybody when it comes to working out, um, you know, resistance training, I don't think there is any better workout than resistance training because like you say, not only do you get, you know, the muscle building effects and the bone building effects, but you also do get um, cardio. Now, it might not be in cardio but of an endurance athlete, but, you know, you're still right. doing cardiovascular building, especially if you're doing, like, kettlebell swings or something like that. So, Janet has something to say. So, um, the importance also, I believe, of, of the resistance training is the core balance because as we are aging and mm-hmm. um, our balance doesn't 
always stay with us. And so exercising and doing that core and, and keeping that resistance is important for our balance. And the older we get, the harder it is. And, and I know just from a standpoint of we take care of patients of all ages, but especially our elderly patients, you know, a fall is not a minor thing it could be a major thing so as we are training even as we're younger we need to keep it in mind that balance is crucial right also bone density you know as you age you naturally start to lose bone density but um, when you exercise it can help slow that process down absolutely so you know your, your bones need the same level of resistance that your muscles need yeah and let's remember with you know, it's not just exercise with bone density because it's got to be, um, you know, weight bearing exercise. So, which really the only exercise that I can think of off the top of my head that doesn't qualify would be biking and swimming does not increase bone density because you're not, they're not weight bearing. I don't know, can you think of something else, Noel, another one that might not be weight bearing? Um, I think those are really uh, good too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just think about, you know, like moving your body in space and feeling tension like you should feel like it's a, it's taxing to do that movement um, obviously if you don't feel anything then that typically that part of your body is not engaging so you definitely want to make sure that you're building that resistance um, and, it, and it can't and, and the other mistake people make is they'll do just you know one set or they'll just do five reps and then they'll stop you know you really want to build build on to the next. So first off, you want to do with something that's called progressive overloading, which means that progressively you should be incorporating either more resistance, more reps, or more sets. So you shouldn't be doing the same level of activity now as you are a month from now. So it should change. You should see some progression happening over time. Um, and, you know, your body needs time to assimilate. Like you can't just do one set of an exercise and think that's enough. Typically, you know, I recommend doing at least three sets to really work that muscle, not necessarily to failure, but to fatigue. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you are consistent with the movements that you're using as well so that your, your body has a chance to adapt to that particular exercise. Otherwise, every time you do it, you're going to find the same amount of struggle. You're not going to see much improvement. Yeah, you, you have to progress. Either, like you say, like either weight or reps um, or both or number of sets. I mean, that's the, way you're, that's the only way you're going to progress for sure. Mm -hmm. So can you speak a little bit about stability and mobility as we, as we age or for anybody, actually? Um, I know that's something I've struggled with is stability and mobility. Right. So um, mobility is really important. We try to incorporate that into our work as well, especially because most of us are segment. You know, we sit a lot, um, we're crouched over behind a desk, so, you know, our body takes on these positions that are not natural. And if you don't correct it, your body will start to adjust itself to that uh, position that you're most often in. And so, as a result, your posture will suffer, you'll start to feel more back pain. A lot of those aging things that we, a lot of the things that we attribute to aging is really just a prolonged response to bad form. You know, like the back pain that you feel, the hip pain, a lot of that is not just a matter of aging, it's because you're either, you're overloading one side of your body more than the other side too often, you're sitting for too long and not stretching and correcting your form, you're walking with a slouch, there are things that you're doing incorrectly in your body as a result of responding to it. And so you can actually reverse the effects of aging by incorporating mobility stretching um, and, and coordination and stability work into your routine. Um, stability work is really important also for core, to maintain your core strength, but also, you know, as we age, we become a little bit more liable to, you know, trip or, you know, lose our footing here and there. You want to make sure that when you're training, you're not just practicing in a, the same plane of motion that, you know, all the time. You want to really kind of try to mimic planes of motion that you would move in in everyday life so that when you are like when you fall you don't just fall forward all the time right you might fall to the side or back so you want to make sure you're training yourself yep. in all those different planes yeah, lateral so that you can respond yep. right 
your body knows how to respond if you were to fall off balance in one of those directions. Um, and just training your core will help prevent that. Okay. Core strength is also important for your back. You know, posture, core, I would say, I would say is probably number one. If you were to focus on one part of your body first, core is number one. Absolutely. So, all right, we got one minute to wrap it up. Noelle, what are your parting words, and how do people get a hold of you for virtual training? Well, I would say, like you said before, it's never too late to start, um, and you're, it's never too early to start. Um, you can do a lot um, in, in, you know, reversing the effects of aging. Um, age, to me, is just a number, and so it's really about your what your, your lifestyle looks like. Um, you can reach me either through my website, which is leadingedgeny.com. You can check me out on Instagram at body by Noel, um, and you can find my email contact on my website. All right, and we will have our producer put that in in our show notes of how to get a hold of you. This has been a wonderful show. Such an honor to have you on today, Noel. I'm so glad that, that we connected. And thank you. you. Yes, thank you. You were listening to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham at AM 1470 KBSN in Moses Lake. We will see you all next week.